And Jen, are we recording? Oh, yeah. Yes, we are recording. Welcome, everybody. We've got folks joining us um, for our next edition, our next episode of Sustainable in the City Thinking Upstream. Um, this welcome. There's so many of you. I know we've got a lot of folks that have signed up for this uh for this today, really looking forward to having you all and, and talking about our topic, um, eating locally and local food systems. So of course, uh, I'm Jen Harmon with Metro Public Works. I'm here with Patrick and we'll just give you with Urban Green Lab and we will give you all a few minutes to get everybody into our, um, our little webinar here and then we'll get going. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Uh, and uh, until we get going, Jen and I can regale you with some uh, playful banter <laughs> uh, which is the real reason why everyone's here. Uh, and, you know, more than that, I hope everyone gets a chance to go outside today. Uh, I don't need to tell you all, but it is a beautiful day uh, if you are in Nashville right now. Hopefully that snow, that disgusting, awful, horrible snow has melted uh, and you're getting a taste of uh, some sun. Yes. Oh, I know yesterday I went and was taking phone calls outside. I still had to be working, but I was like, I'm going to step outside as much as I possibly can because this is, it will not last. It will be cold again. I know that it will, but it yeah. sure is nice today. Oh, you know, uh, I took a walk yesterday and today on my break heard that Beverly. I went for a run today, super out of shape from all the uh, food I've been stuffing in my face for the past couple of months, but uh, it was a nice day for a run. Yeah. Oh, I was thinking about getting out on, getting on a bike ride. Mm -hmm. Haven't done that in so long. My bike has been so sad, staring at me, not doing anything for the winter. You're super close to the number three Shelby Bottoms entrance. Uh, I didn't know it had a number. Yeah. I just yeah. know where it's, it's like, at. I didn't know yeah. that. <laughs> I have learned something new today, everybody. This is very exciting. <laughs> yeah, that little, that Shelby Bottoms biking through there is so nice. I can take it easy or I can go across the bridge. If you've ever been over in the Two Rivers part of um, the bike, that trail that's over there, it's very hilly. Yep. It is very tough. I come from uh, St. Louis as well as Chicago have been my previous homes. They're very flat and my legs don't necessarily like biking up and down hills, which is tough here in Nashville. There are so many hills. I thought St. Louis was the city between the hills, but I guess maybe I'm just different St. Louis. I've never heard that. Bathroom? I've always had a flat, pretty flat neighborhood. Yeah. I, I Coming from New Orleans, which is not only flat, but city also the sea level. Uh, I do not like hills. I did take an excursion into Two Rivers once and only once uh, because, you know, I don't, I, I can't do it. You get so far and then you think to yourself, I have to go back still. Yeah. Ooh, a bit and more then there's more hills. That is good right. to hear, Karen. I'm going to move it a little bit closer uh, and talk a little bit clearer. Uh, Karen, would you let me know if this is, a oh, sweet. Thank you. Perfect. All right. Well, I think we are, we're at 12.05 and I think we've got pretty much a, a good number of folks that have joined us. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, so again, hey everybody, my name is Jen Harmon. I am with Metro Nashville Public Works and I am here with my super fabulous co-host Patrick King with Urban Green Lab. And you are here for our fourth episode of Sustainable in the City Thinking Upstream. Uh, this is a collaborative in-depth series where we feature interviews and presentations, panel discussions, Discussions with Nashville's top experts in all areas of waste and sustainability. And today's episode is going to take us to Nashville's local food scene to talk about eating locally and supporting our local food systems. Now, before we get started, a few reminders. If you haven't already subscribed to the series uh, YouTube channel, please do so now. I'll be popping a link to that in the chat in the chat here in a moment. And uh, there you'll be able to find all of our previous episodes from the series. And moving forward, if you miss an episode, you can find it all there. Um, to stay connected and up to date on everything coming up with sustainable in the city thinking upstream also make sure that you sign up for urban green labs newsletter as well as public works get rowdy recycle newsletter um, we'll get you links to those and how today's session is going to run so patrick is going to uh, be sharing some interviews with you actually i'll let patrick talk about how today's gonna run with um, our panelists because we've got a, a little different setup today but in terms of your questions and chat so the chat is there for you to use if you have questions that you want to ask um, our guests today you can 
can put those in the chat and I will uh, keep an eye on those. If you have technical issues, reach out to me through private chat. Um, Jen Harmon in the private chat, I can help you with any uh, technical issues and I'll keep, uh, keep a check on there. But I'm gonna throw it over to Patrick to introduce our guests and kind of explain how today's show is gonna run. Excellent. Uh, Jen, thank you so much for that beautiful, beautiful kind of run of show. Um, so today, first up, we're going to hear from Chef Lakendra Davis. Uh, she is the co-owner and executive chef for City Farm Co. Uh, she could not be with us here today, uh, just given, you know, kind of managing uh, an entire restaurant. Uh, so that's totally understandable. Uh, so first up, we're going to hear just an interview that uh, a conversation that we had a couple of days ago. Uh, and then after that interview, we're going to be speaking with Chef Julia Sullivan, uh, executive chef and co-owner of Henrietta Red. Uh, chef Julia is going to be with us here live, but throughout the entire both interviews, uh, if you have any questions, feel free to put those in the chat. Uh, and we'll, you know, in typical sustainable in the city style, uh, get to those when we get to the Q&A portion uh, of today's session. And with that, Jen, would you mind stopping your share? Okay. Let's see if we can do this flawlessly. Jen, stop and share. I'm going to share my screen and hopefully everyone can see my ugly mug. Oh. We are coming up here. Here we are. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Patrick King and you are here for another edition of Sustainable in the City, Thinking Upstream. Uh, and today I'm here with Chef LaKendra Davis. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me, Patrick. Uh, thank you so much for being here, first and foremost. Uh, and, uh, you know, a little bit jealously, not jealously, but a little bit candidly speaking, I'm really excited to talk to you because we're talking about food and who doesn't love food. I love food, as you can <laughs> see. Earrings. All those forks? Yeah, they are. <laughs> I just noticed. <laughs> Um, and, you know, with that beautiful start, uh, LaKendra, could you just start by giving us a little information about yourself and your restaurant? So I am uh, LaKendra Davis of City Farm Company. We are a local Nashville catering business. Um, we had a small pop-up um, or takeout kitchen in Marathon Village um, that we opened in 2020. Mm -hmm. um, and currently we're still you know, doing, doing catering as, as it, as it comes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you so much for that. Um, so excuse me, first real question actually. And I know I said before I hit record and I wouldn't swap things around. I guess I was lying. Uh, <laughs> okay. so, you know, you just said you all had kind of like a takeout kitchen, uh, that opened up in 2020. Uh, and I know your restaurant is relatively new. Uh, what's it, what was that experience like, I guess, kind of like, you know, opening a restaurant in 2020 and it was after kind of the pandemic had all got started, right? Yeah, actually, before the pandemic, it was, we were set to open the week um, of the tornadoes um, oh. in Andrew Nashville. Yeah. Um, so that was, you know, a really hard time for the city um, just to recover and Marathon Village is kind of you know, right on the outskirts of most of those areas that, mm -hmm. you know, were really impacted by it. I live in mm -hmm. East Nashville. Um, fortunately, we, you know, weren't impacted by it at all. But um, we definitely took some time to try to figure out, you know, how we were going to um, still open um, mm -hmm. with just kind of the city trying to recover. Um, so that was initially our first um, setback. Um, so we waited for about um, two weeks, um, and then about two weeks after the tornado, the, the pandemic hit. Mm -hmm. um, so we, um, you know, had just bought on staff. We had, you know, we were set to open, um, and then we just kind of hit the pause button to see, you know, how the, the world was, was going to recover, um, mm -hmm. and just really even trying to figure out what COVID really was and how it was affecting everyone. Um, and we actually didn't open for months later. We ended up not opening until June. Mm -hmm. um, and we opened just really with a skeleton crew. We didn't, unfortunately, we weren't able to bring our staff back in. Um, it was just my wife and I, which, you know, the owners, um, mm -hmm. the chef and, you know, my wife handles the business side. So we just stepped in and 
we had maybe one or two people come in on, on busier days and it was just, it was a scary time. You know, we had just invested, um, so much into, uh, you know, the space and getting it outfitted and just, you know, being ready to open. Um, and once we finally did open, we did have a lot of support. We had us a lot of, a lot of new customers. We had customers that had been with us since the farmer's market, Mm -hmm. um, people that have been waiting for us to open. Um, we had did a soft opening, um, not too long before that, just a couple weeks before that. And then, you know, we had uh, this big delay. So we had a lot of people still really interested. So Mm -hmm. when we first started out, it was really great. And then, you know, it just was a lot of ups and downs with percentages of how, you know, many restaurants can, people can have and what type of Mm -hmm. service you can have and people just not really wanting to eat out. Grocery Mm -hmm. stores are still kind of the the go-to thing. And, you know, and it just was really hard to navigate as a new business. Yeah. Um, And unfortunately we ended up um, closing the takeout portion of our business in um, December of 2020. Mm -hmm. Um, And it was just, honestly, it was just the best thing just to kind of scale back, you know, to still be able to function in some, and what we were doing originally, which was just catering and, you know, doing weddings and small events. Mm-hmm. And so that was just more of our goal. Um, no one was really gathering in large groups and yeah. even still now. Um, so it's just, you know, it's been a difficult time just trying to be creative and positive and just trying to, you know, navigate all of the unknowns. And that's yeah. really, you know, all you can do right now. Yeah, there's, you know, so much that's out of your control at a certain point. And then on top of that, uh, you know, restaurants operate at like razor thin margins to begin with. Mm -hmm. Uh, So uh, I guess kind of like a follow up question to that is, you know, vaccines are happening. They might not be happening as quick uh, as some people would like. Uh, But, you know, there is, I guess my question for you is like, is there, you know, maybe a light at the end of the tunnel that you see? Is there any hope of reopening the takeout once Uh, the takeout portion once folks are able to congregate and like see each other again and go out safely? You know, it definitely is, um, you know, and I honestly can't, you know, with 2020 being so uh, life altering, (laughs) Mm -hmm. um, you know, to to say the least, it really kind of gives you a bigger perspective of things and just kind of how you want to fill your days. Mm -hmm. Um, with the takeout, it was you just an uh, extra component, you know, for our, our catering business. Um, and it was a great um, service concept to have even pre-COVID. You know, we weren't doing any in restaurant dining. So it was just a really easy thing. But, you know, as the months have gone on, like my wife and I have just really felt that it is just not... Um, the easiest thing mentally to kind of navigate with everything else that's going on and so you know I can't say that we would never open the takeout again you know because it's just fun it's a it's a true passion I love you know connecting with people new people um tourists that come into the the city um but it's just you know the service industry will recover you know Mm -hmm. hospitality is just you know, it is synonymous with the South, you know, we, we love to be hospitable, we love to, you know, celebrate, and so I definitely think that it will recover, but I think that it's a new normal that we Mm -hmm. will have to adapt to, I don't think that things will necessarily ever go back, Mm -hmm. I just think that there'll be a new way of doing things, there'll be a lot of new concepts, a lot of you know, new service styles that we may be a bit unfamiliar with right now. Um, And so I think that those avenues may be more of what we, you know, would be interested in opposed to just the traditional brick and mortar. And, you know, 2020 puts things in perspective of like, I really don't need all of this, you know? (laughs) (laughs) So, you know. Yeah, no, exactly. And also uh, spoken like a uh, true business owner. There are just so (laughs) many unknowns. We don't know what's going to happen. We're Mm -hmm. hopeful, but more than that, we are adaptable. And uh, that's beautiful. Um, That's that's a really great answer. Thank you for that. Thank you. (laughs) Yeah. 
Um, so um, moving on to kind of the food side of things, uh, you know, there's a there's been a growing trend of restaurants that are prioritizing local ingredients, uh, such as yours. Uh, could you tell me why that's important to you um, and your co-owner and your slash your wife? Yeah, <laughs> um, you know, I um, like we were talking before. It mm -hmm. definitely wasn't something that I knew was important to me. Mm -hmm. You know, I just wanted to make some good food and, and <laughs> I wanted people to like it, you know, um, that was really my goal when I first started out. Um, fortunately enough, you know, I was aligned with um, a lot of amazing farmers at the farmer's market, which is mm -hmm. where my wife and I got our start. Um, and just having that relationship with them really inspired me. It evolved um, me as a chef and just really as a person, like I... I'm not from Nashville. So even in my hometown, I wasn't going to the farmer's markets out, you know, that just wasn't really my thing. Mm -hmm. um, I grew up with, you know, grandparents that would get things from the farm. You know, I sit down with my grandmother and clean collard greens and green mm -hmm. beans, you know, for hours. Um, and she would just get them in these big, you know, trash bags from her friend, such and such at the church that mm -hmm, has a farm, mm -hmm. or, you know, so it was definitely something that I was familiar with. Um, but, you know, as technology evolves and accessibility evolves, you know, those things just become a bit antiquated, you know, trying to drive mm -hmm. an hour away to, you know, to the farm to pick up some things. Um, but when you start to connect in your local community with people and you see that these are everyday people that are actually helping to sustain, you know, your community, like, mm -hmm. you know, and let the world come to an end we're all going to be looking at them to like help us out you know to help us figure <laughs> yeah. out you know how we're going to sustain and 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 move forward and um I think that's really what inspired me to make that a part of my brand and a part of our restaurant was because you know we totally rebranded we were mm -hmm. a totally different company um with different food and we were so inspired that we birthed City Farm Company and we wanted it to be representative of us. We are city people um, with, with these farm roots, you know, of the big bags of collard greens. And mm -hmm. that was kind of a full circle for us to be back at the, the farmer's market and have some of the best beef, you know, from KLD mm -hmm. Farms mm -hmm. and, you know, have some of the best milk. <laughs> and some of the best eggs and you know just like to be able to have access to these things and to taste fresh strawberries and fresh blueberries mm -hmm. it was you know it was a mind-blowing experience that really just shaped me um so that's why it became important to me to really support my local community keep that money here keep it mm -hmm. you know revolving in my community and then also be able to put out some of the best you know products that money can buy <laughs> yeah no uh another beautiful and eloquent answer. Um, I think the point you raised about kind of how to a certain extent folks can kind of just be disconnected from where their food comes, right? Talking about those modern uh, sensibilities, you know, like you can pick up some collard greens from the Kroger, put them in your bag and that'd be it. Uh, but you know, those come from somewhere, right? Mm -hmm. That has to be grown by someone that has to be picked by someone that has to be shipped to the Inglewood Kroger mm -hmm. by someone. Uh, you know, and, you know, maybe there is something that's kind of lost from like that, that, that disconnect from like where your food comes and like to how it gets to you. And like, it seems like that kind of like spurred your passion, like mm -hmm. learning, like, like, I guess relearning, like where the, those, like those, those food systems, because, you know, all else fails, we still need to eat. Food still has to come from somewhere. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. And uh, I'm not sure if Ken listens to Sustainable in the City thinking upstream, uh, but Farmer Ken from KLD Farms, I just want to give a big shout out to you. Yes, thank you. <laughs> amazing family. <laughs> amazing family and amazing, amazing food. Mm -hmm. um, so um, are, what are some of the benefits of sourcing food locally as a restaurant owner? Some of the benefits are, are those local um, connections, those relationships, mm -hmm. those personal like cell phone relationships of, hey, I need this, um, <laughs> you know, and I can drive out to your farm to pick it up. Um, mm -hmm. You know, a bit of it is nostalgic. A bit of it is just style, honestly, like the, the, the way that I like to get food, like to know mm -hmm. that, 
you know, these eggs were hatched uh, 45 minutes away from me, um, you know, just last week. And they're usually still dirty when, we, <laughs> when they come to me. Um, to me, that is just a benefit that I think is just a bit forgotten. You know, people used to get their milk delivered, you mm-hmm. know, and it was a reason for that. It was because it was from the cows that were, you know, local to this particular place, this town or the city. Um, mm-hmm. And it was usually in glass containers, glass bottles, like, and that was, you know, helping the environment. Like mm-hmm. things have just changed so much. And it's like, when you have that ability to support those local people, you usually are doing more than just that. You're supporting the environment, mm-hmm. you know, you're, you're really just supporting um, people that are just like you. you yeah, know? yeah, um, absolutely. Uh, are there any drawbacks? Kind of like the flip side, yeah. There, there are definitely some drawbacks. You know, there's some drawbacks just as far as availability. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not always available because mm-hmm. they're not these, you know, mass producers. Um, the prices, you know, um, they have to, you know, support themselves because they aren't putting out, you know, a million chickens, uh, you know, a year or whatever the mm-hmm. case may be. Um, and because of that, you know, it limits your profitability as yeah. a local business. You know, people, they see local owned businesses and they see our menu prices and they're just kind of like, well, if this is the, what I got to pay for local, like I, mm-hmm. I don't want to. And even sometimes it's just because people can't afford to. And, mm-hmm. and, I, and I get that, but it's like, you know, that is a drawback. It's just already having, being in the industry where profit margins aren't what we're known for. Mm-hmm. And, <laughs> um, and, you know, to already kind of make that sacrifice because that's really what it is. It's like, I'll may not get this back financially, but it is, you know, going to benefit me somehow, you know, Mm -hmm. in in my community and my environment um, and just kind of taking that sacrifice. But it it is, you can't charge the premium that you want. I can't charge you $20 for this brisket sandwich. (laughs) Although that would benefit me, (laughs) nobody's going to pay for it, you know? So um, that's a, a drawback and just, you know, always not being able to make that quick trip. You know, I'm going to run over here and grab this. I'm going to go over here and and do this. Um, But it's it's all worth it. Yeah, no, I couldn't agree with you more. There's like, you know, there might not be any tangible benefits that you can see about like making sure the money you spend like stays in Nashville or in middle Tennessee. But there are, you know, so many benefits that come from that, like supporting those farmers, making sure your food doesn't have to travel like a thousand miles to get to you. Uh, you know, that does so much, you know, good for our region and for the planet in and of itself. So, I mean, mm-hmm. I, yeah, I think that was a really great point that you raised. Um, and kind of on that note, uh, is there anything that folks would be surprised to learn about our region as it relates to local food? And maybe another way to kind of flip that question is, uh, is there anything that sets Middle Tennessee apart from other regions of the country in regards to local food? Um, you know, we, we have a lot of options in Mm -hmm. Tennessee, you know, just from different meats. Um, you know, a lot of people may be surprised to know that Tennessee is like one of the highest producers of goat meat. Um, we're like, yeah, we're like second in, in the nation for that. Um, not a close (laughs) second by any means. (laughs) <laughs> Not a um, Texas is like, you know, so far ahead of us in goat meat production, but we are second, mm-hmm. um, which was surprising to me, you know, like um, you just not something that is synonymous, you know, with, with Tennessee. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I think that's really surprising. And then, you know, we also have um, with our seasons, I think that we've become a lot more resourceful. You know, mm-hmm. you have a lot of preserved things, a lot of pickled things um, mm-hmm. that is synonymous with the South. But I think that, you know, a lot of people don't really think about, about why and mm-hmm. just kind of how people learned over the years how to preserve these things, you know, for our seasonal droughts, basically, that, that yeah. we have. But 
um, Tennessee is a, it's a great place. You can get a lot. You can get, you know, so many different things, just fresh produce, great meat, you know. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. And that also reminds me, PSA to everyone listening, support your local farmers markets, support your local farms. Can't stress that enough. Uh, if you if you financially are able to without breaking the bank, for all the reasons that we both had just mentioned, support your local farmers. And also there are so many, um, or I shouldn't say so many, but there are programs out there that mm -hmm. will help assist those um, that may be on public assistance or on lower incomes to get you fresh produce from the farmer's market. So, you know, check that out in, in your local community, like in your local um, service people, like they will be able to tell you how to get access to that, you know, through SNAP or, you know, whatever the other resources may be. So, mm -hmm. you know, there are ways to get fresh produce from the farmer's market, even on a, a low budget or a tight yeah. budget. Yeah, no, that is, uh, that's a really great point. Yeah. Uh, and kind of leads to the last question on that high note. Um, if folks are interested in learning more about you, yourself, or your business, um, what's the best way to kind of go about doing that? Uh, the best way is our website, um, mm -hmm. cityfarmco.com. Um, we have a bit of a sabbatical right now, <laughs> just trying to, you know, readjust and recover and the snow isn't making it any better. <laughs> um, but, you know, we... Um, yeah, that's the best place to reach us. And always, you know, our Instagram is probably our most uh, active mm -hmm. social media page. And that's also City Farm Co. Excellent. Okay, I will be providing those links uh, in the chat when folks see this, uh, see this live. Um, but before we go, is there anything else you want to say? Let folks know? Parting words of wisdom? I don't know. <laughs> I would say, you know, try it out. You know, there's mm -hmm. some people who have never step foot in in a farmer's market and i would just say try it out you know take take a walk around see what you can find even if it's subbing out one thing that you may buy from the store um and just trying it every little bit helps you know this industry is really really trying to recover so any dollars that you can spend with your local artisans and restaurant owners mm -hmm. um, you know do that if when you can so yeah i would definitely say that Excellent. So some parting words of wisdom from Chef LaKendra Davis, uh, catering, restaurant, entrepreneur, extraordinaire, uh, <laughs> farmers and farmers market enthusiasts. Uh, LaKendra, thank you so much for speaking with me today. Thank you for having me, Patrick. I really appreciate it. Yes, uh, that was my interview with Chef LaKendra Davis. Uh, and um, if you would like to follow up with her, uh, Jen, would you be so kind as to just plop her email address into the chat. Is it already there? I can't it's already it. there. Uh, then I will shut up and introduce our next chef, uh, Julia Sullivan, uh, executive chef and owner of Henrietta Red. Woo! <laughs> Hi, Patrick. How are you? I am doing good. I'm doing good. I'm so happy to have you with us here today. So happy. It's a beautiful day. Uh, and I really appreciated kind of like your entrance in there. It's just like somebody pulled the, the curtain back and it's just like, Julia. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'm actually at home today, which was unplanned. Um, I unintentionally scheduled myself off on today, which is our fourth birthday. So today's the fourth anniversary of opening Henrietta Red, which is so exciting. That's doubly exciting because today is my 30th anniversary of being alive. Oh, wow. Happy birthday. <laughs> happy anniversary to you starting a restaurant. Yeah. <laughs> um, excellent. All right. Um, let's get on into it. Um, on that note, Julia, could you start by telling us a bit about yourself and your restaurant? Yeah, absolutely. So I uh, am from Nashville, born and raised. Um, if you were an Uber driver, your first question is, oh, that makes you a unicorn. Um, <laughs> but really, truly, I mean, being back in Nashville is, I think, you know, so many people I know and grew up with are still here and, um, you know, part of the community. And for me, that's one of the best parts about owning a restaurant in Nashville is getting to see people every day that I know and went to school with and um, folks from the restaurant industry. So I moved back here um, almost eight years ago now um, and started working on um, opening Henrietta Red. Previous to that, um, I had left Nashville to go to college in New Orleans, which I think is significant because 
um, Nashville at the time, you know, I graduated from USN in 2001 and uh, it was the same year that Margo opened. So for those of you who are familiar with Nashville's restaurant trajectory, just to give you a sense of like where we are at that point, it wasn't this bustling, you know, tourist driven cultural restaurant scene. It was, um, it was, you know, pretty quiet at that time. So went to Tulane and was exposed to like this beautiful cultural heritage, Southern culture, music, restaurants, food festivals, and really started uh, working in restaurants at that time um, as a hostess. Um, I saw some old timers <laughs> attendees in the chat. So if you remember, you know, Mambu, um, Da Vinci's Pizza, that's where I started host hostessing. And then um, started cooking in New Orleans and eventually came back to work for Laura Wilson at the Wild Iris in Brentwood in 2005. And a lot of you know Laura now because she's been so involved in the farmer's market. She opened Citizen Kitchen in East Nashville, such a huge part of the Nashville food scene. And I always like to mention Laura because she was the first, my first real chef. And um, I remember her walking into Wild Iris with produce from her own backyard garden. And it was the first time for me that like the connection between local seasonal ingredients um, and restaurant cooking was really made. Um, from then I went to the CIA and um, started working at Blue Hill Stone Barns in the Hudson Valley, which of course is an 84 acre organic farm with a giant, beautiful farm to table restaurant. Um, and then I left there and went to New York City, was in fine dining it for a few years before coming back to Nashville to start a restaurant project here. Um, and now I am partnered with Strategic Hospitality, um, who are old, old friends of mine from Nashville. And, um, you know, we have a great working relationship. Excellent. Uh, I didn't realize there was a New Orleans connection there between yourself yeah. and, and Lori from Citizens Kitchen also lived in New Orleans for several years, if I'm correct, right? Um, yeah, she did. She did. Laura's from Chattanooga, but she worked at, um, in New Orleans and she was the chef at, uh, she was an executive chef at one of the Brennan's restaurants. Okay, that's awesome. Um, a little sidebar, I hung out with her a good bit this time last year because I was looking for a king cake. Uh, and I was on the east side and she's like, oh yeah, I used to live in New Orleans. I was like, well, I used to live in New Orleans. Like all that fun stuff. So um, yeah. that's an aside, but we can kind of stay on task here. Um, uh, so what's your, what has your experience been with sustainable food systems and how does that contribute to how you operate your business? I think, I mean, going back to that first kind of connection made with Laura, um, I think if you come from a chef perspective, really, there is no better reason to promote eating seasonally and locally other than taste. You know, for us, it's like when you first taste a local peak tomato versus what you've been eating from the Kroger produce section, um, you sort of, it makes the connection for you that there's just really nothing you can do to make your food taste better than to cook seasonally and buy locally. And so for me, moving from um, the wild iris then to Blue Hill Stone Barns, it just really, uh, it was all about taste and flavor and quality of product and quality of ingredients at that time. And then being at Stone Barns really for me opened up the whole dialogue about sustainability, um, regenerative agriculture, uh, all these things we can do to take and then give back to the land. You know, Blue Hill is where I learned about, you know, um, for instance, putting your chicken coop on wheels so that you can move it around the pasture, things that we can do to um, build our farms and agriculture in a way that, that gives back to the earth rather than just taking from it as we do with industrial agriculture all the time yeah. or monocultures too. Yeah, absolutely. And correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, Blue Hill Farms is featured on an episode of Chef's Table, correct? Yeah, so Dan Barber was the chef. Um, he was, I think, season one, episode two. Okay. And he's, you know, kind of a maniac, but really was a huge influence for me in making those connections uh, and, and between taste, uh, cooking, local food economies, um, sustainability. And, you know, it's been amazing to watch him evolve over the years. You go back to so many restaurants time and time again. And part of what we love as consumers is consistency. And I go back to this restaurant every time because I know the pizza is going to be this way. And Dan is someone who has 
continually evolved over time um, because he's so intellectually curious and just always looking for um, things to experiment with. And his he's all about sustainable agriculture, but for him, it also really goes back to taste. Um, a few years ago, he launched a, a seed company, Row 7 Seeds, where they work primarily with um, plant breeders to come up with new breeds of vegetables that are uh, bred specifically for culinary char characteristics. So nutrition, yes, but also flavor, appearance, um, of course, uh, disease resistance, et cetera, et cetera. But um, I've been having a lot of fun working with them on different um, trials they have for new breeds that they're developing mm -hmm. either by um, sending those seeds to some of our farmers to grow and sell back to us or growing it in my own backyard garden, which has been a lot of fun as well. That sounds so awesome. And yet you're absolutely right on all the points you just raised, but like, you know, there's something that happens to you when you taste a tomato at like peak tomato season and like peak flavor. And, you know, it's really hard to like, after you do that, to like, not like, okay, like this just clicks a box in my head. Like, I wonder what else I don't know about how things taste, uh, just because I've been so used to doing the same thing, uh, you know, possibly for my entire life. Uh, so yeah, that's a really awesome point. Um, so uh, your restaurant features a lot of fresh seafood, uh, considering Tennessee is landlocked. Could you tell us a little bit of how, about how sustainability factors into you purchasing these products? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, certainly serving seafood in Nashville is a choice. Um, and it's something that um, I always knew was possible because um, some great, you know, some of the great oyster bars in um, the United States are in landlocked locations. And so, you know, I knew through various distribution systems that it was possible to do here uh, very well. And a lot of that we do the same way that, um, you know, you were talking about previously, it, it's all about relationships with, with growers. Mm -hmm. And so we really get our seafood one of two ways. And the first way is through distributors, which are kind of in trucks on the ground. Um, we make a choice to purchase um, almost all of our seafood that's not oysters. We typically purchase from the Gulf or from the East Coast of Florida. Um, we work with a distributor out of Birmingham, Alabama called Evans Meats and Seafoods, and they work with various docks and boats um, to bring in product and sort of be our um, intermediary with these different uh, sources. Um, we try to, um, besides sourcing from particular locations, we try to also make choices of things that are considered like not overfished, you know, so, so making choices about if we're going to sell seafood in Tennessee, what can we sell that is uh, relatively low impact? Uh, things like Spanish mackerel, for instance, we have going on on the on the menu this week out of Florida. Um, and the second part of that is mostly what we call direct to chef relationships, which are essentially you know, we have a pretty extensive oyster list at any given time. It's been smaller during COVID, but typically we like to have up to 15 or 18 varieties, which is pretty nuts. Um, a, about a third of those usually come from the Gulf, if not a little bit more. And those, for the most part, do come through Birmingham. Um, anything that doesn't come through Birmingham is coming direct to chef from the West Coast or the East Coast. So, um, you know, a lot of Washington State, sometimes from um, California, a lot of New England, uh, a lot of North Carolina. And usually what happens is the, these oysters are harvested and either that afternoon or the next morning they're shipped to Nashville. So most of what we um, get in, and we typically get in seafood about five to six days a week, but most of what comes in oyster-wise has been harvested within the last 24 hours, which is pretty amazing if you think about it. Um, and, and you know, it's something we're pretty proud of. We try to always order so that we're, we are, you know, if you come in that week, you get oysters that were delivered that week. Um, and, and so, you know, it's, it's definitely been a process for us of building those relationships, knowing our purveyors, um, knowing what oysters we like and we don't like, sort of understanding the food cost implications of different varieties. Um, and yeah, it's just a process of getting to know people and getting to know their products. Um, but oysters in particular, 
to me are just fascinating and you know in the context of sustainability there's a lot to talk about there too so so that leads perfectly into my next question um a mainstay of your menu are oysters uh could you give us the scoop on them as both the sustainable protein option and the role that they play in the environment yeah, absolutely. So oysters are so interesting. Um, I could probably talk about them specifically just for an hour or so at least. Um, but just to give the basics, they're, they are hermaphroditic. They fertilize their own eggs. And typically, the oysters that you get in restaurants these days are um, farmed, not wild caught. And tip, you know, when we think about the word farming, especially in the context of seafood and you think about farmed fish, is typically a negative. But in oyster culture, the word aquaculture is a huge positive because wild caught oysters are usually um, off bottom harvesting, which means they're dredging the bottom of the ocean floor, which breaks up these microclimates and um, ecosystems for smaller sea animals. Um, it, you know, destroys reefs, um, that kind of thing. Oysters actually grow more like plants. I've heard people call them planimals, which I know some oyster growers really don't like. But once that seed is fertilized, they really do just plant themselves on whatever surface is nearby, whether that be, um, you know, reef structure, empty oyster shells, um, you know, ropes, baskets, really anything that's nearby. And once they start growing there, they do just begin developing a shell. Um, and typically the oysters we see in restaurants are harvested anywhere from um, nine months to three years from when they start growing. A lot of that has to do with, um, a lot of it has to do with climate. So for instance, if you think about something that's grown in um, Duxbury, Massachusetts versus Pensacola, Florida, Pensacola is so much warmer that the water never really goes through a dormant period. And so um, there's kind of algae and plankton and all this stuff that oysters can feed and get fat and grow on all year round. Whereas in uh, Massachusetts, Prince Edward Island, anything up north, uh, Washington State, um, they do go through this period of dormancy throughout the year. So they grow much, much slower. And so the, the time to harvest in those climates is quite, quite a lot longer. So, as they grow, um, each of these little oysters can filter up to about 50 gallons of water per day. So they're really, really healthy for their own ecosystem. And in these kind of reefs that are created by growers, either by um, uh, there a couple, the two most kind of common ways of growing these days are either by hanging long lines where they put the seed in, in bags or they're put in cages that are floated by buoys closer to the surface of the water and they can sink them to different levels. So they sit and they grow and they filter water and they um, you know, feed on plankton. And then the, um, the little fish and other sort of you know, animals in their environment have kind of a natural man-made oyster reef that they can also uh, survive in. And so it, it's really kind of like a, um, a very low carbon footprint cycle. It also, you know, because the, um, they grow in natural environments, there's never any, you know, added food, there's never any antibiotics, hormones, any kind of that. So um, as far as a sustainable protein, it, it is, um, it's, you know, typically we think about eating them off the raw bar or an oyster po' boy or what have you, but a lot of the oyster farmers I talk to actually encourage chefs to encourage consumers to think of other ways to consume them, to make them a more uh, integral protein in your diet because they are such a, um, a sustainable way to eat. Yeah, uh, oysters are absolutely fascinating. And just from hearing your, your passion and just like knowledge about oysters, I'm just so, so, so much more interested in oysters now on top of them being delicious on top of how there's, you know, uh, terroir with the oysters, depending on where they're from. And mm -hmm. on top of that, they are a sustainable protein option. And I feel like maybe we should probably, Jen, uh, we can talk about this later, but maybe we should even do an episode on aquaculture because I listened to a just fascinating podcast earlier this week on seaweed and kelp. Uh, yeah. But that's another sustainable in the city for another day.
Um, so I've got two more questions for you. Uh, the first, uh, do you have any advice for someone who wants to directly contribute to supporting local food systems, uh, both at home and with their dollars? Yeah, absolutely. So I think there's a couple things and, you know, almost every conversation we have these days relates back to the pandemic. Um, so I apologize, I will have to do that. Some, but I think it, the pandemic really helped us kind of, I mean, it really, really exposed some of the weaknesses in our system, right? So one of those weaknesses is that the restaurant industry employs 16 million Americans um, in, you know, small to large restaurants all over the country, a lot of them um, independently owned, a lot of them fixtures in our communities, um, which means they employ people in your community, you know, um, from chefs to servers to dishwashers to cleaning ladies. It's not just the, the restaurant, but all these sort of industry adjacent, um, you know, logistics, uh, beverage, the beverage industry, you know, all of these different uh, players up and down the food chain, farmers, florists. Um, and so um, it's, you know, in terms of in the restaurants, how can you, how can you support using your dollar? And I think when you go into restaurants and sort of what LaCondra was talking about is that when you, when you go in and sometimes have sticker shock in some of these places, I think really appreciating the amount of hands it took to bring this food to your table and execute it so you can sit back and relax and enjoy that meal is really important. And I think the sooner consumers become comfortable with kind of the real costs of putting food on the table, um, the, the more equitable the whole system will be. Um, as far as at home, I think, you know, for me, uh, this year has been really amazing because I've spent more time at home, just like anyone else. Um, but I've still been in the restaurant every day. But instead of traveling on weekends or going to events or or whatever, I've I've been spending my downtime growing a garden, which has been really, uh, really amazing. Um, I think growing some food of your own on whatever scale, I think not only impacts um, the environment, but also the way you eat. I mean. Think about, you know, when you go to the grocery store and you buy those little packets of a few leaves of basil for like $4 and then you take that piece of plastic and you put it in the trash. When like, even if you're in an apartment, um, you know, in a condo in Germantown, you can do such a small amount of growing just on your patio with such little effort that will enhance your own cooking. Um, so gardening and composting at home um, to whatever degree and scale you can, I think is probably the best way. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I uh, am kind of planning my garden right now, so I'm right there with you. I'm going to be making a whole bunch of hot sauces very soon. Uh, and, you know, one point you raised is like really, one point both you and Chef LaKendra raised was just like the real cost uh, that goes into that restaurant experience that folks might not be aware of. And I feel like that is kind of, you know, occupying the same place in like people's like memory banks of, you know, that disconnection from food, uh, where, right. where food comes from. And it's, it's not just something that's served to you on a plate or just something you see on a wall at Kroger, it comes from somewhere. And I feel like that's a really good point that uh, a lot of folks just might miss out on sometimes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think oh, that, that's uh, an interesting, you know, if, if we can all remember back to this time last year when the tornado had just hit and the pandemic was starting, it, it, it did, I think, put a real sense of panic in people's mind about where they're, you know, getting to the grocery store and getting all that. And then just, I think just being more connected, whether it's by growing yourself, by going to the farmer's market, like she said, or um, by tuning into your local CSA or, or what your restaurants are doing um, to provide food for the community. I think just looking around at those lo local resources and knowing whatever dollars you do put, put back into those are gonna directly impact your neighbors as well. Absolutely. And speaking of local resources, Jen and I have something for our viewers very shortly, but I have one more question for you before we get to our Q&A. Um, if folks are interested in learning more about you, uh, your business, and menu offerings, what's the best way to go about doing that? Oh, well, you can find us at henriettered.com, and we do have, um, uh, uh, let's see, we have 
um, our menu reservations, uh, takeout options on there. Um, you can find us at Henrietta underscore red. I'm at Julia Keelan on Instagram. Um, and yeah, just happy to, um, if anybody ever has any questions, just reach out to us, info at henrietta.red.com. Beautiful, beautiful stuff. Thank you so much for being with us here today, Julia. Uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Jen. Um, what is the Q and A look like? We've only got just a couple of questions and one of them was just retracted, uh, but that's okay. So we're gonna start off with them. Um, this comes from Abby. Does your restaurant donate leftovers to various organizations around town to those that are food insecure? Yeah, so that's a good question. Abby, and I think, you know, my immediate response is we really don't have that many leftovers. Um, you know, and I think, I think most good restaurants try not to, because if we have a lot of excess food, then it was really very bad for our costs. And like she mentioned before, it's, you know, it's not a very high margin uh, business. So every piece of food you're throwing away is money lost. Um, but you know, they're, they're, this year, again, was so different from others. We lost power for six days during the tornado. So the first thing we did was we unloaded our um, walk-ins, which were not being cooled, into the kitchen at the uh, Skirmerhorn Symphony Center. And we immediately started turning the, that food into um, meals to be donated to National Food Project and first responders. Sure. We've had other shutdowns this year, um, whether it was, you know, the occasional positive COVID case that we needed to close for a few days to deal with, um, or, you know, just recently the snowstorm. So we do, we do donate to organizations when we um, have the opportunity. We also try to take some of those things and turn them into usable products. So we're feeding staff meal to our staff every day at three o'clock. We make a big meal and we all take an opportunity to sit down and eat. A lot of that um, food is very usable, but it's past a point where we wanna serve in our restaurant. We have kind of a three day rule at the restaurant. We try not to over prep and have leftovers beyond three days, but if we do, we turn it into a meal for our staff. Another example is Again, after the tornado, there have been bars all over town that had shut down and then couldn't reopen because of, co uh, you know, the shelter in place. So we went and collected um, citrus fruit from all the bars around town, turned it into uh, marmalade, and then sold it to raise money to benefit some of those restaurant workers that were out of work that week. So um, I think any chef is trying to get creative, not only to save food waste, but to save money as well. Well, another question on that same note is um, that you didn't hit on was about food scraps and wondering if you also compost any food scraps that you might have when you do have them. Yeah, absolutely. So we've worked with Compost Nashville since we opened um, and I love seeing their um, stats at the end of every year about how much we compost. It's kind of, you know, it's a lot. It's a lot between um, things that let's say, you know, apple cores and oyster shells, and then also things that are coming off of tables. It really adds up, I think particularly for us because we do compost our oyster shells and they weigh a lot. You know, we're essentially composting rocks. <laughs> so so yeah, we, we compost through Compost National. We have a station set up around the kitchen then also at the back door so that they can pick up. It's been hard for us to do this year because it's one of those expenses that while we're not, we have, you know, we've, we've been losing money this year. So we had to kind of, eliminate everything that wasn't absolutely essential to being operational, but it's definitely one of the first things I'm committed to bringing back when we're able to afford to. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then our, uh, our next question is, how is your menu impacted with uh, food slash health aspect? And I don't know if, if that makes sense to you or if we need to ask the person to explain a little bit more. Um, yeah. <laughs> I clarify that food health aspect. Yeah, Michael, if you could in the chat, go ahead and um, expand upon that question. But then we've got one other uh, question that was in the chat that was also part of a statement uh, that I'm going to share because I love it. Um, so Sarah says, I wonder if Julia uses buck snort trout. Um, she said she gets it at the farmer at the Ridgeland Park Farmers Market and hasn't started her backyard aquaculture yet, but she has that as a garden goal. Yeah, we do have trout on our menu sometimes, and we use buck snort. We also sometimes use um, a company in uh, 
uh, Western North Carolina called uh, Sunburst Trout Farm. Um, they both make really, really nice product. I actually think the, the Buck Snort, uh, they have really, really different flavor profiles. The Buck Snort to me has a much like cleaner taste. Uh, the Sunburst has a, like a little bit earthier, troutier taste. So I like both for different reasons. We don't have either on our menu right now, but it is nice to have that uh, like hyper local fish option for sure. Very cool. Um, so that is, I haven't heard back from Michael. If anybody else has questions, those are the only couple of questions that we had um, in our chat. Um, if y'all do have any other questions, feel free. Um, what is this next? Okay, Michael has provided a little bit of some context. He has said, um, say, making meat an option rather than the main course. Yeah. So. One thing I think, I was just speaking to somebody about this this morning. When when I opened Henrietta Red in um, 2017, it wasn't that long ago, but again, we've seen all these like sort of turning points in the Nashville food scene. And when I first moved home, I felt like a lot of the menus were very meat heavy, very um, pork heavy, this kind of idea of like Southern cooking, which, you know, actually there's like so many vegetables and, and um, and I think there's, this was sort of like this contrived idea that all we eat is like pork belly. So I really wanted something that would be appealing to, you know, it could be all about Southern ingredients and local ingredients without being like this sort of stereotypical Southern food. So if you look at our menu, we try and have a really good um, diverse uh, options that are, you know, is vegetables, seafoods, and then meat proteins um, that, and, so, and a lot of times the meat is, is on a dish, but it's not like the center of the plate. So you're not going to see a lot of like eight ounce steaks. You might see a little bit of braised chicken in a pasta dish or something like that. So we really try, that's another way I didn't really mention that we, we kind of try to even things out a little bit from a sustainability perfect, uh, perspective is almost never having meat at the very center of the plate. And we have, so we're going to switch if it's okay. There's a question that came in that's not exactly about food, but it's about sustainability in restaurants and um, about kind of packaging and wondering about your thoughts on compostable or reusable to go containers. Yeah, I mean, gosh, again, this is like, we never did to go before this year. So I have a lot of thoughts about it. I would love to not be doing it, number one. Um, However, I'm really, really happy to offer it to people, our customers during this time where so many people don't feel comfortable eating out. So I do, I, we will continue to offer it, um, both out of financial necessity and because we miss seeing our regulars. Um, and yeah, it's a bummer. It's a bummer because even, even though we, I know we and a lot of our neighbors are using specifically compostable packaging, um, but as so many people point out, if you're not actively composting it, does it really, mm -hmm. so it goes back in the landfill. So yeah, it's a huge conflict. It's expensive. It's wasteful. It's a bummer. I don't think any of us want to be doing it. So I don't really have a good answer for that, except it like composting. I'm kind of committed to phasing it out. Like <laughs> we're able to do that. You know, you bring up such a great point about compostable materials. It's great to have those compostable materials, but in so many cases, if you don't have access to actually send that to a composting facility, then it still is. It's just going to, to landfill. And a lot of folks have this idea that, oh, it's biodegradable. It'll break down, but it's it's so different. And it, and it doesn't do that in a landfill situation. And I know from us at Public Works, it's definitely part of our planning to make um, access to compost more accessible to everybody here in Nashville for sure long term um but that's an excellent excellent point um oh and another really oh go ahead patrick i just noticed we're oh i just noticed the time yeah so we are at our one o'clock time uh that was my i'm supposed to be on top of that today my apologies we will ask this other question real quick but um for those of you that do have to hop off um thank you all for being here we are going to get you a follow-up email that's going to have links to resources it's going to have links to the youtube um i also just want to really quick do a screen share and show you what we want you to think about in terms of thinking upstream um for moving forward patrick if you want to talk about pick tn products real quick I can take this one. Uh, if you have not heard of PICTN products, um, get ready for the second part of your life to start. Essentially. 
Uh, Pick Me In Products is kind of like just a one-stop shop for anything that revolves around local produce and our local food system. Uh, through this website, you can identify a farmer in your area that you want you can support. Uh, you can reach out to them, do a CSA. You can reach out to them and uh, just you know find out exactly what kind of products they make, whether what farmers markets they're attending. Uh, you can find the closest farmers market to your own home. Uh, but more importantly for me, uh, I really like this resource just because you can also figure out what exactly is in season in Tennessee, middle Tennessee, based on what month it is. Uh, and so if you're like really trying to eat super sustainably and only eat what's in season, uh, and more than that, if you just want to support your local food system, pick TN products as a one-stop shop to do all of those things and more. And with that, I'm going to just share this other last slide. So to remind you, here is our next session. I am going to drop in the chat a link to our next session, how to help local wildlife thrive in your own backyard. That's going to be coming at you March 10th at noon. And of course, if you have any ideas for upcoming sessions, things you want to know about, email those to us. Those are our email addresses. You can also uh, reply to that follow-up email that you'll be getting from Patrick. Um, and with that, I'm going to stop sharing because I do want to ask this last question to our panelist, to Julia. And of course, thank you, Julia, for being here. This has been, I am so fascinated by the oysters. I have learned so much, um, especially as a vegetarian. I'm just very fascinated now. Um, but our last question is, do you permit customers to bring their own containers? Which I think is an excellent question. Yeah, we actually haven't run into that with takeout. And I'm not sure how it would work, but we certainly allow you to bring your own to take if you're taking food, um, like if you have food left at your table. I saw my friend Jill in the chat and I know Jill has done that. Uh, we don't have any problem with that if people wanna bring in their own clean to-go containers when they're eating in. Awesome. All right. I don't think there's any other questions that uh, I see in here. So I think we're wrapping it up at 104. Um, oh, might be against health code for to-go, for bringing your own to-go containers. There's. I think we could have a whole nother conversation about just restaurant to go containers. So we will cut it there. Um, but thank you all. This has been uh, fabulous. So much to learn today. So much to take away. And we will see everybody, hopefully March 10th at our next uh, Sustainable in the City. Thanks, everyone. Thank you all so much for being here. Join us on March 10th. I'm sorry, Julia. Oh, no. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Thanks for having me. <laughs> all right. Um, yeah, uh, thank you everyone. We hope to see you on March 10th. We'll be hearing from Debbie Sykes from the Nashville Wildlife and yes. Center. Uh, there also might be special live animal guests <gasps> if that does anything oh for anyone. Uh, and um, yeah, thank you all for being here. We'll see you all next time. Cool, thanks. <laughs> that was great. All right, bye everybody. <laughs>